Hey guys, Frank Spear back with you for another edition of Watch This. And today we're going to look at Luke chapter 16. And I'm going to attempt to show you here how this parable of the rich man and Lazarus is the same as almost all of the parables of Jesus. Parable of the talents, parable of the wedding feast, parable of the sheep and the goats, parable of the ten virgins. They're all the same. Even the parable of the uh, prodigal son. They're all telling the same story, just in different forms, in different uh, story forms, different characters. So without a lot of rigmarole, let's just jump in. Verse 14 of Luke 16. Now the Pharisees who were lovers of money were listening to all these things, Jesus' teachings, and they were scoffing at him. They're mocking him right there. These are the serpents. This is Satan. This is the devil. This, these are the dragon of Revelation 12. I just did a second video um, called Satan is Who? Part 2. So watch part 1 and part 2 of Satan is Who? And you'll see that these guys were Satan. Watch this. And he said to them, You are those who justify yourselves in the sight of men. That's in the sight of Israel. You do wrong, but you justify it. You cover it up in the sight of Israel. You make excuses. Watch this. But God knows your heart. He sees what's going on. He knows the inner you. For that which is highly esteemed among men is detestable in the sight of God. You're apostate. You're wicked. You're hypocrites. You think you're worshiping God. You think you've got it all right where it needs to be because you're children of Abraham, you're blood Israelites, you're descendants of Abraham, you're genetic ethnic Israel, so you think you're all good with God, but you're not. He sees your hearts and they're black and they're corrupt. Verse 16, the law and the prophets were proclaimed until John the Baptist. But since that time, the gospel of the kingdom of God has been preached and everyone is forcing his way in. Wow. He says the law and the prophets was the message of the old covenant kingdom and that's been being preached up until John the Baptist came. But he started preaching something else. He started preaching the message of the new covenant kingdom. A new Jerusalem, a new temple, a new home for the Shekinah glory of God. Revelation 21, 22, Hebrews chapter 12. So the law and the prophets are going away. A new message has come. And you better, he, the message was, flee from the old because the new is coming. Get into the ark because the flood is coming. The great war. If you don't want to perish in it, when that old system is going to be destroyed, there's going to be nothing left for you. Many of the Pharisees we read in other passages did believe eventually. They did believe in Messiah. Watch this. For the kingdom of God has been preached and now everyone is forcing his way in. Watch this, verse 17. But it's easier for heaven and earth to pass away than it is for it to fail. Heaven and earth is the law and the prophets. It's old covenant Israel and their system of law and sacrifice and priesthood and so forth. So he talks about the law and the prophets. Then he talks about heaven and earth. It's the same thing. They're going to pass away. Jesus said... Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. He also said he came to fulfill the law and the prophets, to bring it to its conclusion. That's all there in the book of Daniel. Jesus just fulfilling what Daniel said the Son of Man would fulfill. A wrapping up of the temporary kingdom of national ethnic genetic Israel as being the peculiar people of God that foreigners had to join themselves to via circumcision and mosaic law keeping in order to become people of God. That system, that world, that is going away. It will be burned with fire. 2 Peter chapter 3. But it's easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one stroke of the letter of the law to fail. So the law is not going to fail. The law is just and holy and good, as Paul said. It didn't fail. It just ended. The time for it was wrapped up. For the 613 Old Testament commandments, 
that the Jews and the Israelites had to live under in order to be the covenant people of God. That was Adam death. Watch my four videos on the resurrection if you want to know all about that. Yes, it's four hours. It's a lot of time. But we watch four hours of TV a night, don't we? <laughs> Most of us. Verse 18. Every, then he says, Everyone who divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery. And he who marries one who is divorced commits adultery. Well, they mocked those teachings uh, um, of Jesus about the law and his his take on the law, you know, the Beatitudes and the things Jesus began to say about the, you have heard it said about adultery this, but I say, well, they were scoffing at his teachings. And many of them were probably committing adultery, and that's why Jesus brings it up here. He says, God sees your hearts. You justify yourselves before men when you commit adultery and you do these things, but God knows what's going on. Then he just nails them with that law. You're committing adultery. Face it. I think that's what's happening there. Then watch this. Now he's going to tell them a parable in context. He's going to tell them a story about themselves. And this is the same story as the sheep and the goats, the wedding feast, the parable of the talents, the prodigal son. It's all the same. The sheep and the goats, it's all the same. This is a sheep and goats parable. Now there was a rich man talking about the Pharisees. He's talking to them, remember? He's literally speaking to them. And then he goes into this parable while he's talking to them, the Pharisees. Now there was a rich man, and he habitually dressed in purple and fine linen, joyously living in splendor every day. That's how the Pharisees dressed and lived. And there was a poor man named Lazarus who laid at the gate, covered with sores. I don't think he's literally covered with sores in this parable, yes, but it's a parable. It's symbolic for something else. Just like when the... Uh, prodigal son goes out and eats the slop among the pigs. He's not literally eating slop among pigs. He's living among foreign peoples, unclean peoples, the swine. That's how the Israelites saw the Romans, as swine. He's living among the pigs, the foreigners. He's covenanting with, covenanting with them. That's why he's eating among them. It's all symbolism, folks. All of it. Watch this. Not everything in the Bible. I'm saying these parables. And a poor man named Lazarus was laid as, maybe this was, Jesus was bringing in his literal friend Lazarus here, using him in the parable, I don't know. But a poor man named Lazarus was laid at his gate and covered with sores, not literally, right? He's spiritually sick and he's coming to the Pharisees for help. That's the context here. Jesus is saying, you justify yourselves before the people of Israel, but God sees your heart. You're supposed to be their teachers. You're supposed to be the ones they come to who lead them to God who help them in covenant fellowship with God and lead them into truth. And yet you're dark and black and, 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 and sinful and hypocritical. And you, you shut these people out. Remember Jesus said that to them. He says, you tie up bundles and you put them on ben, Ben's backs and you make them twice as much a son of death or hell, the grave, as you are. They were dead in Adam. That's the death he's going to go on and talk about here. They were covenantally, spiritually dead these people. And so was this Lazarus guy. And he's sick with sores. Jesus' healings of the sick people were signs pointing to the fact that Israel was sick. Watch this. Jesus hears a little, heals a little girl. He says, she's not dead. She's only sleeping. She's 12 years old. That's a picture of Israel. Jesus heals a woman who had an issue of blood. She's bleeding out and dying. That's a picture of Israel. She had the issue of blood for 12 years. It's a picture of Israel bleeding out and dying. The feeding of the 5,000. 12 basketfuls left over. 12 disciples. On and on and on. It's all pictures of Israel in their death of Adam. In the day that you eat of this fruit, you shall surely die. All of Israel was descended from Adam. They lived in covenant death. They were only covered over by the blood of animals for all that time until A.D. 70 when all that was destroyed, that whole system that began in the garden with the covering of Adam and Eve with animal sacrifices. That whole system of animal sacrifices ended in 70 A.D. And there's something new began. From that point forward, and the gates are open 24-7, 360 from that time forward into the new Jerusalem where there's no animal sacrifice because Christ put an end to that. He was the once for all sacrifice, the real one that came and paid the price for all of their sins. 
those who had faith in him. That's what the parable is talking about here. It's talking about sick and dead Israel in a story form, like Aesop's fables, with the fox and the bird and the ant and the snake representing people. That's what's happening here. Right? Think about Jesus' parables. What literal wedding feast happened in AD 70? What literal door were people knocking on to get in? What door with wood and splinters? What literal talents did Jesus give out to people and say, I'm coming back and I'm going to do the math with my calculator and see who did what with the money I gave? What literal money did he hand them? No. What literal sheep and goats were there at the judgment? You know, Mah. what literal sheep and goats did he gather before him and say, talk to animals? Sheep and goats, animals represent people. Just like birds of the air, beasts of the field, creeping things along the ground. Serpents. They're all representative of people. Even the animal sacrifices were representative of themselves. You've sinned so you have to die. But instead of you dying, these animals, symbolic of you, of national Israelites, they'll die in your place. So the sheeps died. The cattle died. Sheep, not sheeps. Right? Jesus called his he called Israelites sheep. So they took animal sheep and sacrifice them representative of the Israel sheep. It's all representative, folks. It's all symbolism here in this book. The waters, the earth, the trees, the beasts of the field, everything in Genesis 1, they're talking about peoples, the sun, moon, and stars in the heavens is Israel and their system of sacrifice and worship to God. Joseph had the dream that the sun, moon, and stars would bow down to him. That's Israel, the 12 tribes. God says, I will make you as numerous as the stars in the heavens. Jesus said at his coming, the sun, moon, and stars would go dark. The stars would fall from the heavens. The moon would go dark. The sun would go out. That language is all through the Old Testament when Israel was being destroyed by foreign armies. What was Jesus saying at his coming? They would be destroyed by foreign armies because he said, my coming will be just like the days of Moses. Uh, Noah, when there was a flood, a war. It will be just like the days of Sodom and Gomorrah, when those cities were destroyed. He said, my coming will be just like that. And I'll come in the clouds with my armies, the angels, messengers, and I'll destroy this city. If you know your Old Testament really, 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 really well, then when you come to the New Testament, you just say, oh, okay, this is that, this is that, this is that. I know what it is. It's all symbolic language. It's all metaphor. Watch this now. And a poor man named Lazarus was laid at the gate covered with sores and longing to be fed with the crumbs that were falling from the rich man's table. And even the dogs were coming and licking his sores. Wow. Even the dogs were coming. Where else do we see dogs and crumbs from the table? We see that in Matthew chapter 15. We see the Canaanite woman, a foreigner, not an Israelite. She's a Canaanite. She comes to Jesus and she asks for a miracle, a healing of her daughter. I believe it's a daughter. And Jesus says, I came for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. There's sheep again. I came for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. She said, yeah, but even the dogs, the foreigners, get to eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Let me make sure that's the right wording there. Matthew chapter 15. I'm going to flip right back to it real quick. Yes. Okay. Then he says, Woman, your faith is great. Jesus also said to another non-Israelite, uh, Italian, a Roman centurion, I've not seen faith like this Italian guy's faith in all of Israel. Even the Israelites don't have the faith of this guy. Isaiah 56, God tells eunuchs, like we see in Acts, non-Israelites. He tells eunuchs and foreigners, non-Israelites, that he would, God would make a memorial to them in his, in his house, in his temple, in his people, Israel. He would make a memorial to the foreigners greater than that of the sons and daughters of that old covenant kingdom, the Israelites themselves, the the uh, um natural born children of Abraham, genetic Israelites, that these foreigners would be greater. Jesus said to the Italian guy, 
he turned to the Israelites and said, I haven't seen faith like this among the sons and daughters, among the children of God, Israel. This guy's got more faith than they do. This is all throughout the scripture, folks. So back to the rich man and Lazarus. Now watch this. So, and longing to be fed with the crumbs which were falling from the rich man's table. Even the dogs were coming and licking the stars. Who are the dogs? The dogs were non-Israelites, foreigners. So here's a guy who's spiritually sick, looking for help from the Pharisees, who were the ones who were supposed to be the teachers in Israel, and giving this guy help from God, and they camp. And so he's sick spiritually. It's a parable. And so these foreigners, these God-fearers, who have come in from the outside to become part of Israel, are giving this guy help. They're leading him to God. Watch this. And it's, in, in the parable, it's seen as licking their sore, licking his sores. Right? Now watch this. Now the poor man died. That's Lazarus. And he was carried away by the messenger to Abraham's bosom. And the rich man died also. All right, follow me here. I don't think this is talking about physical death at all. These guys are dead Israelites. Right? These guys are dead Israelites. This man is sick, right? We'll, we'll talk about Lazarus first. They're both sick, spiritually sick. This man dies. He's covered with sores. He's spiritually sick. He dies. I think that death is the death in Adam, the spiritually dead Israel. Wait a minute before you say, oh, come on. Paul said in Ephesians, you were dead in your trespasses and sins until you became alive in Christ. We see that language all through Paul's writings. He says, I was alive apart from the law, but the law came, sin revived in me, and what? I what? I died. Did he die physically? No. His sin killed him. These people are sin dead. We could look at 50 more passages that prove that kind of death. So these people are sin dead in the parable, in the fable here, if you will, in the picture book story. You know, in kindergarten, you had cards up along the, close to the ceiling, along the wall, right? And you had the letter A and there was an apple and you had B and there was a ball and you had C and there was a cat and so on. Those were pictures of the real thing. You couldn't take that apple down at lunchtime, that picture and eat it and be satisfied. It's not the real thing. It's a sign pointing to something. It's a parable of sorts telling you about a real thing in some similar way these are similes right there's that is similar to this story jesus is saying what's going to happen at the end is similar to this story almost all of his parables are about what was going to take place at the end in ad 70 at the end of the old covenant system when which was replaced by the new covenant system the temporal one the adam death the body of moses was dead and the new body was alive, and that was an eternal body, and is an eternal body. That's the eternal life that the Bible talks about. Watch this. Now the poor man died and was carried away by the messengers to Abraham's bosom, and the rich man died also. The translators trans that, translate that word angels. That just means messengers. I believe these are Jesus' disciples, like we see them in a lot of passages. And he sent out his messengers to invite them to come to the wedding feast. It's the same word. Only sometimes they translate it messengers and sometimes they translate it angels. These are people. So what are these people doing? This guy's in Adam death. He's in Old Covenant Israel death. And the disciples of Christ carry him away to Abraham's bosom. What is Abraham's bosom? It's the new covenant kingdom. They carry him away to faith in Christ. Call it what you want. Call it the wedding feast. Call it the new Jerusalem. Call it the new temple body. Call it the resurrected body. Call it the new creation. The whole creation groans and pains a childbirth for this woman, Old Covenant Israel, to give birth to New Covenant Israel. Call it the New Covenant. Call it the new baby that was born. Call it whatever you want. It's called a, a ton of things in the scripture. Abraham's bosom is the New Covenant community. The same thing as the church. They were, you could say they were carried away to the new Jerusalem. To the new city of Revelation 21. Whatever simile 
you want to use, that is used throughout the scriptures. This is just saying the guy got saved, basically. Saved out from the old and into the new before the old was destroyed. Now watch this, verse 23. And the rich man died also and was buried. So he's dead also under the old covenant system, like Paul talked about. But Paul said there was a resurrection coming. This guy, the rich, the poor guy, was resurrected, so to speak, at the end. He was resurrected into the new covenant community. Carried away, like 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17. Carried away to Abraham's bosom or to the New Jerusalem or into the heavens or into the air, which was the New Jerusalem because it was up in the air, in the heavens. Just like Mount Sinai was up, where the old covenant was given. The new Jerusalem is up. I'm being incredibly redundant in these videos because I don't want you to walk away saying, I didn't understand what he's saying. Even if you disagree, I want you to get where I'm coming from. Now watch this. And the rich man also died and was buried. So he's dead also as an old covenant Israelite in sin. And in Hades, the grave, symbolizing covenant death, not the literal grave, not the literal grave, but where Jesus said they would go if they rejected him as Messiah. He said you would perish. You would go to the grave. You would remain in this death because there's no salvation left for you afterward. You, you really got to get your mind around that. These people were dead in their trespasses and sins. Paul said so under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. They only come alive in Christ. If you're not in Christ, you're dead in Adam. You're in Hades. You're in Sheol. You're in the pit. You're in the grave. Whatever you want to call it. This guy was carried away to Abraham's bosom. He's in the new covenant community. He's in resurrection life. He's in eternal life. This other guy's carried away into Hades. Death. He stays dead. Watch this. And he cried out. I'm sorry. He's in Hades. He lifted up his eyes being in anguish, in torment. Well, that's the book of Revelation. What happened in AD 70? They were burned in the fire. The old covenant system of Judaism was destroyed. Most of them died in this fire because most of them were centered in Jerusalem because they worked there. They did their ministry from there. That's where they lived. That's where they breathed. That's where they had their being. And that they all died in the lake of fire. Go read Isaiah chapter 37. The old city of Basra, one of the Edomite cities, was destroyed. And God says, I will destroy it by a lake of fire. He brings in a river of burning pitch. And he destroys it. It says, the smoke of their torment goes up forever. Well, it didn't literally. That's symbolic language for their destruction. Same thing we see in Revelation 14. Same thing we see here. This guy has been destroyed along with the old covenant system. This Pharisee who was not carried into Abraham's bosom but was left in the old covenant death. And he was destroyed in AD 70. Perished. Watch this. He was in Hades. He lifted up his eyes being in torment and saw Abraham far away, far off. Which is Old Testament language for being cut off from the people of God, the covenant people of God. Now he sees Abraham and the people in Abraham's bosom, those were who, who were of the faith of Abraham, right? The new covenant saints were of the faith of Abraham. They were in Abraham too, like they were in Christ. Read Galatians. Paul brings that, he says, he says, how are you going back to the law after you had faith in Christ? What's the matter with you? Did Abraham become uh, a believer or was Abraham counted righteous because of the law or by faith because he believed he says he because he believed that's what made him righteous so you need to believe like Abraham believed therefore you'll be in Abraham you'll be like Abraham you'll have the faith of Abraham that's all that's being said here in parabolic language the righteous guy went to the new kingdom to Abraham's bosom the unrighteous guy died under the old covenant system in Adam death still covered by blood of bulls and goats which served him no good purpose and he cried out and said figuratively here right he cried out and said father Abraham have mercy on me send Lazarus so he could dip his finger in water and cool off my tongue I'm in agony in this flame 
What is water? Jesus says you'll receive the water of life is the new covenant. You drink the living waters. Dip your finger in the water. It's too late for you. The door, the, the door to the wedding feast is shut on you. It's too late. You rejected Messiah. They're not let in. Jesus would open the door if they would repent, but they're not repentant. Go back to the wedding feast in Matthew chapter 25. Jesus looks out the door and he sees who's knocking. The unbelievers, the goats, they try to get into the wedding feast. He looks and he says, they say, let us in. He says, I don't know you. That's why they can't come in. He would have let them in had they repented and he knew them, but they did not. That's the same thing that's going on here. Dip your finger in the water. Open the door and let me in. No. He says, then go and send people to preach this message of the, of the new kingdom to my family. He says, look, if they, didn't, if they didn't believe the law and the prophets and Moses, meaning the scriptures, if they didn't believe the scriptural predictions of the Messiah and what he would bring about, then they're not going to believe one of these resurrected Israelites either, these new covenant preachers. He says, send somebody back from the dead to go preach to them, meaning send one of these new covenant preachers who've come alive in Christ. He says, that's what's going to happen at the end. This is, this is what's going to happen to these people. Let us in, let us in. No, you're shut out. There are these Israel-only people who say the kingdom was shut in AD 70. The door to the kingdom was shut. Nobody was ever allowed in. I did a whole video on that called uh, A Closed Door and an Open Gate. Watch that. But Look at another parallel passage where Jesus tells the same wedding feast parable. He says that some unbelievers did get in and they were dressed in the wrong clothes. And he finds out that they don't have the right clothes on. He kicks them out. So in one parable, the door's shut on them and they're not allowed to come in. In another parable, they're kicked out. But they already gotten in. These are just parables signifying the same thing. The division that would take place between the old covenant, gone, finished, ended system at the end when the new covenant started that's all they're parables perhaps when he shut the door on them he kicked them out first like in the other parable and they tried to get back in and he said i don't know you you don't have the right clothes on these these parables are not signifying that the kingdom was shut to everybody if that's the case why are the gates of the new jerusalem open 24 7 365 forever what do you have open gates in heaven for if, the, if they were raptured off the planet in a Superman rapture, flew up into the sky, visibly or invisibly, doesn't matter, and they were all dwelling in heaven there and still are, but that, that was shut to everybody else from AD 70 forward. That's what the Israel-only movement teaches. Then why are the gates wide open up there? What are the gates open for? Shouldn't they be shut? You say the door was shut in Matthew 25. Shouldn't the gates to the kingdom be shut because nobody else allowed in? doesn't make any sense. It's unreasonable. It's incorrect to be polite. It's just incorrect. The Israel-only teaching is incorrect. Anyway, there's so much more I'd want to say about that. But this parable of the rich man and Lazarus is the same as the other parables. It's figurative language talking about what was going to happen in AD 70 when the old covenant system of Moses and Adam passed away and the new covenant system began. You were either a Pharisee, a rich man, or you were Lazarus. You were either a goat or you were a sheep. You were either a wedding guest or you were uninvited or one who rejected. You were either one who did well with the talents or one who was foolish with the talents. You were a good slave or a wicked slave. You were uh, one of the virgins who had oil in the lamp and one or one who didn't have oil in the lamp. T pick your poison. All the parables are telling the same story for the most part. Anyway, guys, thank you for listening today. I'll see you in the next one. I'll put a link to my book on demons down below. Thanks to all of you who have bought the book so far. A lot of people really enjoying it. Um, some who have not contacted me about it probably hate it, but that's all right. Hey, you can't please everybody. All right, I'll uh, talk to you guys soon. Bye.